Hi, this is Gary with MacMost.com. Looking to buy a new Mac? Which model is the right one for you? MacMost is brought to you thanks to a great group of more than a thousand supporters. Go to MacMost.com slash Patreon. There you can read more about it, join us, and get exclusive content and course discounts. So Apple just came out with new MacBook Pros and a new iMac. So now they have a complete lineup to end 2023. If you're looking to buy a new Mac, you're probably wondering which model you should get. Apple's lineup right now is more compact than it has been in a long time. There are really just nine models that you can buy, and two of them we can eliminate pretty quickly. So you can see here there are five MacBook models, three MacBook Airs, including an old M1 MacBook Air that Apple's still selling. Then there's only one all-in-one Mac, the iMac 24-inch. Then there are three different desktop Macs. These are Macs that come without a screen. We can eliminate two of these. I wouldn't recommend buying the old M1 MacBook Air now. It's priced really low for educational institutions and things like that, but it's really not that much more expensive for an M2 MacBook Air if that's what you're looking for. And you're going to get at least one, maybe two more years of use out of it in the long run, making it worth spending just an extra $100 there. And at the other end is the Mac Pro, which is really for high-end professionals, for people that work in production studios and the like. For most users, getting an extremely powerful Mac means the Mac Studio, not the Mac Pro. So let's get rid of those two. And that brings us down to seven models, four MacBooks, and three desktops. So, of course, the big decision you need to make at the beginning is do you want a MacBook or do you want a desktop Mac? A MacBook, of course, is portable. You can take it with you anywhere. So it's ideal for students or people that need to take their Mac with them from home to work or some other location. It's also, of course, great for bringing with when traveling. And even if you use your Mac mostly in your home, but you use it in different rooms of your home. So usually it's pretty clear if you want a MacBook model rather than a desktop. You can still take a MacBook and plug it into an external display and use it as a desktop machine. It's got that advantage, but it also has the battery in it and the portability. So let's take a look at if you decide you want a MacBook, which one you should get. There's a division between MacBook Air and MacBook Pro. So the MacBook Air models now using the M2 processor have just that one processor option. These are lower priced models. The screens aren't as advanced, they're a little bit lighter weight, and the two screens are smaller, 13 and 15 inch models, as opposed to the 14 and 16 inch of the MacBook Pros. Don't be afraid of the fact that they've got M2 processors in them. We'll probably see MacBook Airs with M3 processors in them next year, but there's really not that big a difference when you go from M1 to M2 or M2 to M3. So it's perfectly fine in 2023 and early 2024 to buy an M2 MacBook Air. In fact, this is the very machine that I've got as my portable Mac. They are limited in the number of ports they've got and the number of external displays you can attach, just one to them. So if you need more external displays or you need to hook up a lot of peripherals, you probably want to look at the MacBook Pro. But the price is great. These are fantastic for students or anybody with just general casual use for their Macs. But with my MacBook Air, I still occasionally use it to do some pretty heavy lifting, like using Xcode to program or using ScreenFlow or Final Cut Pro to produce these videos. I mostly do that with my desktop Mac, but if I need to, I can do it with my MacBook Air and it works pretty well. So a thing to remember with low-end Macs like the MacBook Air or the Mac Mini that we'll look at in a minute is you still can do pretty intense work on them. You most likely only run into trouble if you try to use lots of different apps at the same time, like maybe After Effects and Photoshop and Excel and Final Cut Pro all at the same time. But you can use any one of those individually at the times that you need to on even the MacBook Air or the Mac Mini. Now the MacBook Pros are great because you can go to the higher end processors. So of course they're M3 now, they're new. But more important than that, you can use the Pro or the Max version of the M3 processors. Those are much faster. When going up different levels, like from the base to the Pro or the Pro to the Max, that's a much bigger jump than, say, going from an M2 to an M3. MacBook Pros also have multiple extra screens depending upon your configuration. If you really want lots of extra screens, you want to get one with an M3 Max processor in it. And the screens are much better. So if you're doing Pro graphics work, these screens are probably going to be better for you than the ones in the MacBook Air. 
Also, of course, the higher end MacBook Pro models have Thunderbolt 4 ports. So if you need to connect a lot of fast peripherals, then the MacBook Pro is right for you. And in addition to that, it should be noted that if you really want a lot of screen real estate but still want it to be a portable Mac, then the ultimate one to get is the 16-inch MacBook Pro. That's the main advantage of that model, having that big, brilliant screen if you need to work with a lot of things like in Final Cut Pro or Xcode. Now let's take a look at the desktop models, starting with the all-in-one, the iMac. So the iMac is a lower-end Mac. only comes with the M3 processor. You can't go up to, say, the M3 Pro. But it comes with its own screen, of course, and you get a keyboard and mouse with it as well. So you're not spending that much money and you're getting everything that you need. The iMac looks great and, of course, uses almost no cables at all. You can just get away with just the power cable, really. Then it looks great and it comes in all those different colors and all of that. It's great for casual use. It's basically the equivalent to the MacBook Air but on a desktop with a much bigger screen the 24-inch screen being way bigger than even the 16-inch screen on the MacBook Pro. So here are the three desktop models. So if you decide the iMac is for you, then you've just got that one choice. If you want to go with a headless Mac, something that doesn't have a screen, then you've got the Mac Mini and the Mac Studio. You can look at this as basically one choice. The lower end is the Mac Mini, and then you have the larger version of that, which is the Mac Studio. So it depends on what you want. If you want to use the M2 or M2 Pro processor, then you can do the Mini. If you want to go above that to the M2 Max or M2 Ultra processor, then you go with the Studio. Other than that, it's a very similar design. The Studio is just a little taller. And of course, the Studio is also capable of a lot more. You get four Thunderbolt 4 ports with it. The number of displays really depends on a few things. Like First of all, the Mac Mini and the Mac Studio only have external displays. Whereas, say, the iMac has its own internal display and you can have one additional display. The same thing with little MacBooks. They're about additional displays because obviously there's one that's built in. Also, of course, the number of displays depends on the display. A 4K, 5K, 6K, or 8K display. The lower numbers, like only being able to do two external displays for a Mac Studio, that would apply, of course, if you were attaching two 8K displays. If you're talking about 4K displays, you can attach up to six of those. Now, at the low end of the Mac Mini, you can get really cheap, all the way down to $600. So it's a great bargain option if you already have a screen, keyboard, and a trackpad or mouse. Even boosting up a little bit with a little bit extra memory and a larger drive still makes it a good bargain compared to an iMac if you already have a screen. Now, there are a lot of reasons to go for a Mini or a Studio over an iMac. One of them is to separate the display from the Mac itself. This could be really useful if you plan on upgrading your Mac more often, say every three, four, or five years, you can keep the same display. Say if you get Apple's really great studio display, you can keep using that with your next Mac as well. Whereas, of course, with an iMac, you're replacing the entire thing. And while the Mac Mini is still a good machine for casual home use, if you're going for pro use, for using this for work, for making money, then the Mac Studio's higher price makes a little bit more sense. So no matter what you're choosing between, whether you're choosing between a MacBook Air and a MacBook Pro or a Mac Mini or iMac and a Mac Studio, you always have to think about the fact that your needs and your budget are different than everybody else's. So if somebody else advises you to get a MacBook Pro over a MacBook Air, ask them why, specifically not for them but for you. Why does it fit your budget and your needs better? The same for getting a Mac Studio over, say, a Mac Mini. Why does that make sense for you? Not for somebody else, but for you, for your needs and your budget. Everybody's a little different. That's why Apple has all of these different options. Now, you may have two or three decisions to make even after you decide on the right model for you. For instance, here for the Mac Mini, you can decide between the M2 or the M2 Pro processor. So you're spending more money to get a processor that's much more capable. For instance, you could see 8 and 10 for the cores versus 10 and 16. So this is going to be a much faster machine. If you really feel you need that to do pro work, then you're going to want to make that decision. The same thing when looking at a Mac Studio and deciding between the Max or the Ultra versions of the M2 processor. But after you decide that, you've got two other decisions to make on all models. One is how much memory should you get? Here are the memory options for a MacBook Air. You can see you can do 8 or go up to 16, double the memory for $200, and then go up for another $200 to 24 gigs. 
Now, a lot of people will advise you to start with 16 gigs, but it really depends on your needs. For casual home use, 8 gigs is fine. Macs are excellent with memory management, and you swap space on the very fast built in SSD to handle more apps, and more things going on. I've thrown a lot at my 8 gig MacBook Air, and it can handle a lot. Not as much as my Mac Studio that's got 64 gigs of RAM, but for most casual users, the 8 gigs may be fine. There are a lot of people today spending money on 16 gigs when 8 gigs will do, and a lot of people advising casual and home users of Macs to get more memory than they really need. The other decision you need to make is how much storage. So some Macs start with as little as 256 gigs of storage on the SSD. I would say that's not good for anybody. At 256, a lot of that's going to be taken up with the system and apps, and it's going to leave very little room for you to store any of your files. And if you think you don't have many files, well, you probably have some photos, you probably listen to some music, you might either make or download some videos. It adds up quickly. Even if you don't think you're using much, it's easy to overlook some things that you do or to forget that a year or two from now, you may start using your Mac in a different way. I would at the very least get 512 gigs of storage in any Mac that you buy and even go up a higher level to future-proof your Mac for things you may do in the future and the files you may accumulate before I would look at memory. And if you're thinking, well, I can just get external storage if I need more, well, keep in mind that using iCloud always uses the internal drive. So if you have a lot of files and you're going to store them in iCloud, which most people should be doing, then you're going to want more space on your internal drive. External storage isn't going to help. And it's also going to be a pain to carry external storage with you everywhere you go if you're using a MacBook. Plus, the internal SSDs on Macs are much faster than the external SSDs that you could buy online for cheap. And the reason I recommend prioritizing storage over memory is from years and years and years of answering people's questions and hearing people's problems that often come down to the fact that they didn't get a large enough drive in their Mac when they first bought it. I hear this all the time and it's constantly causing people problems. Whereas if somebody got too little memory, that can usually be solved by simply not running too many apps at the same time when you need to do intense work. But again, it comes down to your needs and your budget. If you have the budget to get both memory and storage, then get both. But if you have to settle for upgrading just one, make sure you upgrade your storage first. So in summary, if you're a casual or home user, then you can look at the MacBook Air or the iMac or Mac Mini for low-cost Macs. And if you are a pro user, you need to use intense apps like maybe Photoshop or After Effects or large Excel databases, maybe Xcode, then you want to look at the Pro models, the MacBook Pros or the Mac Studio. However, even if you're a Pro user, you can probably get by with any of the lower end Macs as long as you don't try to do too many things at once. And if you're a home user that has a larger budget and wants to have something more powerful, you can certainly go for a MacBook Pro or Mac Studio as well. I hope you found this practical Mac Buyer's Guide useful. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, click the thumbs up button below to let me know. I publish new tutorials each weekday. Hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out.